happens if someone decides to undergo a gender transition and then they want to go back. That's the subject of Mary Margaret Olihan's book, D-Trans, True Stories of Escaping the Gender Ideology Cult, published this week. Daily Signal journalist Mary Margaret Olihan spent time extensively interviewing those who transitioned and then decided that they had made the wrong choice. In the book, Olihan also chronicles how she believes doctors embolden teens to take hormone inhibitors and undergo, quote, top surgeries, but dismiss requests to reverse course. Here to discuss her findings and her book is Mary Margaret herself. Welcome, Margaret. It's good to have you on. So great to be here and joining you ladies again. So let's get into some of the research that you relied on to write this book. Can you just introduce us to some of that? Yes, yeah, so I'm very grateful to some of these researchers like Lisa Littman, for example, for the work that they've done on this topic, because unfortunately it has become a very polarized issue. It should not be a right or left issue, right? We're talking about kids here. We're talking about informed consent for children. Um, but unfortunately it's become one of those things where if you deny so-called gender affirming care to kids, you are framed as hateful, and bigoted. And so Lisa Littman is a researcher who has really stuck her neck out here, um, done a lot of studies on children who are trying to transition. And she found that only about 24% of young people who tried to transition to become another gender actually went back to their doctors later and said, I regretted this. So this is a small group of detransitioners who actually went back to their doctors, which means that there is a much larger group of detransitioners out there than we are actually aware of. They're just afraid to tell their doctors that they regretted it. And the reason for that is that the doctors often will tell them, as I chronicle in my book, that this is just part of their gender journey. And that's a hugely dismissive thing to say to someone who has undergone such invasive and painful, both mentally and physically, procedures. Uh, and so kudos to people like Lisa Littman. Uh, we're thankful for her research. Uh, and there's much, much more to be done here. So I've started to read some of your book, Mary Margaret, and you basically interview some of the detransitioners who have gone public and, and talk about their stories and why they ended up deciding to go back on their transition. And one of the through lines that you talk about and that the detransitioners talk about is that they never really felt like their underlying mental health conditions were treated properly before they decided to change their gender. And it was kind of sold to them that if they changed sex that all of their problems would be solved. And they found that when they did go through the transition, all of those issues were still there. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, uh, some of the similarities between the various stories of the detransitioners that you talk to. Yes, yeah, so I'll use Luca Hine as an example. Luca is one of these detransitioners who, when she first started talking to a therapist and saying, I think I might be transgender, she says that she feels like she was fast-tracked from there on out along this path. And rather than looking at all of these underlying mental health conditions that she was suffering from, she was just given the green light to begin her gender transition. I'd also point to Prisha Mosley, one of the outspoken detransitioners who's also in my book, Prisha was suffering intensely from anorexia, um, and that was not discussed at all, she told me, when she began her, her so-called gender journey. Uh, and in fact, when Prisha went in for her double mastectomy, which was supposed to be part of this so-called gender-affirming care, uh, she was motivated by a desire to lose eight more pounds by removing her breasts. So that's, you know, that's her anorexia that's playing into that. But unfortunately, it wasn't examined by the doctors and therapists who were pushing her along this path. And this is just, it's so unthinkable, too, that all of these young people who they're going to medical professionals for help, and instead of being helped with scientific facts and scientific research, uh, they're being told, oh, you feel this way? Well, let's do that. Let's follow your instincts and let's follow your feelings and let's put you through very invasive hormone 
uh, treatments and let's also put you through irreversible surgeries. And keep in mind, these girls are teenagers when they're going through a lot of this. They have no idea if they want to get pregnant eventually. They have no idea if they want to breastfeed ultimately. Chloe Cole told me that when she began her, her gender transition, when she was in her early teens, she had never even thought about whether she would want to breastfeed. Because what 13-year-old girl has, right? These 13-year-old girls are not thinking, oh, I would like to breastfeed someday. It's something that they think of when they have mature and become a woman, but Chloe wasn't given that opportunity. Now, there's a lot of reporting by the AP and other news sources that many people who detransition don't actually regret the transitioning process in the first place. And we have pretty high reports of regret for elective surgeries in the U.S. and in many modern Western countries. There's also this aspect of gender-affirming care for people who are cisgender to affirm that gender, right? Breast augmentation surgeries, breast enhancement surgeries, male enhancement surgeries. How would you categorize elective surgeries maybe as different or this, the same to these transitioning surgeries? Well, first of all, I just like to clarify, gender affirming care is a phrase that's a, more of like a euphemism that was created by these pro LGBTQ or pro trans groups. And really what gender affirming care is, is uh, transgender surgeries, hormones or puberty blockers. And that's all used in the, even when we're talking about kids. So from the Associated Press, you'll see reporting such as, you know, um, Florida wants to ban gender affirming care for minors. What they mean is Florida wants to protect children from transgender surgeries, hormones, and puberty blockers because children can't actually consent to these things at that age. They have no idea what will ensue from these things. And as the release of the WPATH file shows only last month, we know that these treatments are experimental. We still don't know what effect they have on children or on adults. Uh, the WPATH doctors know that the hormones can cause tumors in young people. They can cause lack of fer loss of fertility. And as the girls in my book explain, uh, they cause increased muscle growth, bone density, all kinds of things that ultimately make these young people seek help after they detransition because their bodies are all messed up. So I would just like to clarify on that level that gender affirming care is a euphemism that's used by these activist groups to talk about surgeries, hormones, and puberty blockers. So it's not a good comparison to say that gender affirming care is something that's used for cisgender people because first of all, I reject the term cisgender, that's silly. Uh, and second of all, uh, Breast augmentation for a woman that is, uh, you know, just trying to get that for her looks is a far different thing than a uh, a man who believes that he is a woman trying to get breasts to look like a woman uh, in addition to taking estrogen and pumping his body full of hormones that are going to negatively affect him later. So I'm not sure that that's a good comparison there. But in terms of transition regret, uh, like I was saying, Lisa Littman's study found that only 24% of the detransitioners she talked to had actually told their doctors that the, they regretted their transition. So when it comes to that, there is a huge population of people who are not who detransitioned and are not even telling their doctors that it happened. And why that is, is because the doctors are the people that told them this will make you happy. The doctors are the people that said, yes, you should get this surgery. And so that's kind of like going back to, in a sense, someone that abused you and saying, hey, I didn't like that you abused me. It, it's not, it, it'd be a very hard thing to do, right? And I know the abuse uh, metaphor is dramatic, but if you think about it, this is a, for example, a young girl who went to a doctor when she's in her teens, trusted that doctor that he would perform this surgery on her and trusted that doctor that it would make her happier and her life better. And all of a sudden she's realizing, oh my gosh, I don't have breasts anymore. I want to have a family. I can't ever breastfeed my children. I don't know if I can have a baby now. And this doctor who I'm supposed to have trusted told me all of this was going to be okay and it is not. So I think we can all see why it'd be unlikely that she would go back to this doctor and trust them and say, help me now, I, I regret this. Uh, and so we do really need doctors and medical professionals who are gonna be willing to look at the facts and the science here and say, okay, this child is struggling with their mental health. 
they have a lot of comorbidities. We shouldn't be fast tracking them to a gender transition now. If they want to do that when they're a legal adult, maybe that's a different topic. But while they're a child, we should not be guessing that they can consent to these things, which we don't fully know what kind of impacts they're going to have on them. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things here. I mean, first of all, the breast augmentation comparison. I mean, we are talking about people who are underage here, and I think we would all probably agree that a 13-year-old shouldn't be getting a cosmetic breast augmentation. So I don't think the comparison is quite apt. I think it's a little bit of a straw man. And, and then I would also point out, I mean, to your point, Mary Margaret, as, as you said, um, convincing someone that they can become a member of the opposite sex just by doing the right surgical procedures is, is obviously a fallacy. Um, and there's also a few studies that show that the D-trans rate for children who suffer from gender dysphoria is as high as 85%, 85% of them who end up growing out of their gender dysphoria by the time they reach adulthood. And one of the main studies that has been used to justify puberty blockers is a self-reported study of trans adults, many of whom in that sample, it turns out, actually didn't even transition until they were already adults, and yet claimed that they had been given puberty blockers and hormones when they were underage. So it's a fundamentally flawed study that's often used to prop up this research. Um, but one final question, just really quick, before we go. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting about the young women that you talked to was that a lot of them had had negative experience with members of the opposite sex and expressed a desire to really get out of their body because they had been either sexually assaulted or harassed in some way and were basically uncomfortable with male attention that they were receiving. Right. Um, can you talk about that uh, sort of phenomena of how these women's concerns about how they were being treated by men were used by doctors to then justify becoming a man themselves. Yeah, that's a really interesting part of this that uh, I know I shared with you, Amber, and I think it's really, really important. All these young girls were exposed to, first of all, social media at a really young age. So they're seeing these very highly sexualized depictions of women on social media. They're also exposed to pornography at a really young age. So on the one hand, they're seeing women humiliated and degraded in pornography, and then they're seeing these kind of unattainable images of womanhood on Instagram, and they're thinking, a, I don't know how to be like that Instagram woman. I don't have the clothes or the money or the body. And B, I'm scared to be like the women I'm seeing in pornography because they don't look like they're being treated well. And then on top of that, when you combine the fact that a lot of these girls are experiencing some kind of assault or mistreatment at the hands of men, it's no wonder that they're scared to be a woman and they want to get out of this, this woman's body that they're in. For example, one of the girls in my book was raped. And the thought of being raped again was so terrifying to her that she wanted to get out of her body. She also had a miscarriage from that rape. And the thought that her body had failed her in this way made her just really reject the idea of being a woman. And I think it points to a larger crisis in our culture of masculinity and femininity. You know, we, we villainize both of these things so much when we should be encouraging uh, healthy masculinity and healthy femininity um, and showing good representations of them that allow our young people to just grow up, you know, live a healthy, happy childhood, adolescence before they have any kind of ideology pushed on them. But unfortunately, when they're lonely and they're struggling with who they are and what their identity is and they stumble on social media that's telling them, oh, you feel like you're not a woman, it's probably because you're a man and then they have that affirmed by therapists or school counselors, they're just, they're, they're on the path already. And unfortunately, there's very little resources for them right now to stop. All right, Mary Margaret Olihan, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing the stories of these detransitioners. Uh, a lot of the media don't really talk about them, unfortunately. So we appreciate that you do, and we'll be back with more Rising after this. Thank you so much.